Yeah, I think so. So hey everyone, welcome to uh, next Product Boards event. This one is pretty special because it's you know GraphQL uh, event, as you probably know, since you are sitting here. Uh, I'm super pumped uh, because actually, if I'm not mistaken, this might be the very first GraphQL meetup Product Board ever organized, for sure this year. So I'm super pumped to be the first one kicking off this stage uh, with my presentation, which is called For the Begins, but with very GraphQL, which I admit it's pretty funky name but we will get to it, um, where I'm going to share a um, story and a few tips on how we approached uh, rolling out GraphQL at Product Board while we maintained a massive scale during a global pandemic. And to make it a bit fun, is there anyone who doesn't like or doesn't know Lord of the Rings saga? So everyone actually knows Lord of the Rings. That's great. So we can move on. So I bet you are all saying, what? Like Frodo Baggins, but with, I'm, I'm not sure if I follow you, Ben. And, you know, I'm not going to tell you yet. However, I promise you, you know, uh, I'm going to answer why there is this reference to Lord of the Rings down in the presentation. So you need to wait. I'm sorry. And now who I am. I already refer myself to, uh, as a Yug Ben. That's my nickname. If you have some special, special urge to Google me on the Internet, like this term is going to work. In a civil name, I'm Jakub Benesh. I'm staff engineer here at Product Board. Here's my son, Joachim. Uh, you can find my blog on yugben.codes uh, or my Twitter handle, at yugben. And as always, there's going to be Q&A session. So in case you have, you have some question later, I'm going to answer it. Or even if you, are, uh, if you are in a Prague office, that would be wonderful. We can hang out uh, in after, like in after party. So what I'm going to be talking about, um, I kind of split this presentation into three parts. Uh, I'm going to touch uh, GraphQL and why we have chosen it very quickly at Product Board. Then I'm going to touch GraphQL Federation, wh what it does, like why it might be interesting for you. Um, like, for example, it, if, it, if it's a good use case for uh, your company. And then I'm going to be closing this uh, with uh, basically the tips, uh, how we uh, run that at Product Board, what we did, uh, so you know you can get some inspiration in case uh, it's something you are doing at your company or it's your plan to roll it out GraphQL for your business. But first, let me please double check like who knows GraphQL, and I expect expect everyone since you are on GraphQL meetups, right? But as always, there might be someone who's shy, you know, who <laughs> really doesn't know GraphQL and like the reason why they are here is to learn something about it or they might be some, someone watching the stream. So I prepared my take uh, in three minutes, what's GraphQL? So starting now, GraphQL is actually query language uh, for your API and server-side runtime for executing queries uh, using a type system you define for your data. Uh, although it might sound that GraphQL is somehow connected so to some specific, you know, like systems, databases, etc., like some graph databases, it's not really true. It's it's not, you know, specifically tied to any type of database or storage engine. Instead, it's baked by your existing code and data. Also, fun fact: GraphQL is transport layer agnostic. Usually, you see GraphQL running on HTTP, but you know the specification doesn't say anything like that. So, like we might, you know, like get something something super funky, which is good or bad. It depends on your point of view, right? That's the specification. Speaking about types, um, GraphQL, GraphQL is nullable by default, which is a great behavior. However, I'm not gonna really like be diving into it like in this talk, but we can discuss it later after my presentation. There are default colors. Integer, float, string, uh, boolean. It has support for enums, interfaces, directives. Like uh, directive is basically, if, if you know decorators from Java, Kotlin, TypeScript, it looks pretty same. Uh, and the specification can be found on specgraphql.org. Originally, GraphQL uh, has been uh, created at Facebook, now Meta. But there's a pretty huge uh, open source community running the uh, running the specification as a team. The latest version is uh, from October 26, 2021, and there's already some draft being prepared as we speak. And probably this is the association you have in case you already know GraphQL when I'm talking about GraphQL. Basically, GraphQL is all about that you get what you ask for, as you can see on this, uh, on this slide. Um, in a previous slide, I you know, like showed Maybe I will uh, go there. Uh, very minimal 
uh, schema, you know, definition. And to talk about the uh, schema definition, let's imagine that as a specification what's capable, you know, like for your GraphQL server. So here in this example, we can see that you can query me, which is returning user, and the user has like name, company, both strings, which are nullable. It's not important for now. And that's basically, that's, that's something what clients can then use, you know, like this is the information for them. Okay, so I can do exactly this with the server. And regarding the asking uh, and getting what you are asking for, here in this example on the right uh, side of this slide, you can see that there's some query querying for a name. As you remember from the previous one, there's also a possibility to ask for a company, but we don't care about the company, so we are getting only name. As you can see, like it's a JSON shape. Uh, GraphQL is actually inspired by uh, JSON to some degree. And this, this, this fact, you know, like this getting only what you ask for is great because you are basically not, not really like underfetching, overfetching data. It's super user centric, which is great benefit of GraphQL because, you know, you get the capabilities of API and you are using those capabilities within, you know, like let's say your front end layer or web app. GraphQL is also super opinionated about breaking changes or maybe should I say non-breaking changes. Here in this example, we are using directive deprecated, uh, which also provide us a reason. Please don't use name anymore, use display name. And that's also like something very specific to GraphQL because uh, it's designed with this evolution in mind. Usually, in case you know REST APIs, you know, in REST world, you are asking for a resource. You are asking for specific resource, let's say user with some ID, and you are getting the whole resource. That means basically everything we, we know about that user. In GraphQL though, them. Yeah, okay, it, it works again. Uh, sorry, <laughs> some connectivity issues. In uh, GraphQL, though, uh, you, ask, uh, and you ask for things and you are getting only those things. And this is great because you can instruct your uh, users of your API to use something else. So in this case, uh, case, I'm basically saying, hey, please use display name because I'm going to do something with the name. It's not great anymore. As you can see, the only difference is that a display name is required, so it can't be null, name is nullable, so it's actually like, it might be better API. And uh, the great part of GraphQL is that you have this observability. You basically know like what you know, clients are using, what, what clients are asking. So basically you get all the data. You, you might, for example, know that no one is using this name. No one is asking for it, so you can remove it. So basically you can remove it without fear that you might break some client because no one is accessing this field, which is great. Uh, obviously in REST APIs you have versioning, you have this evolution in mind, which is awesome. And speaking about developer experience and things, GraphQL has really like blooming ecosystem. There is a lot of related support on front end. There's even like forcing function for documentation and discoverability in GraphQL baked in. Uh, within the specification, they specify something what's called uh, introspection, which is basically possibility to extract, uh, um, let's say, capabilities of the endpoint, GraphQL endpoint from the endpoint itself. So in case server has it on, you just uh, have the URL of the server where the server is running and you can get the whole, you know, like schema, the specification, what you can ask the server for with the description, et cetera. So that's, that's pretty neat because, you know, like in uh, REST approaches, you probably need to use some OP, open API and like, you know, like it's something, something on top of it. Here it's baked in uh, the spec itself. Uh, so you, you are getting support from your tooling, from your VS code, et cetera. And that's uh, GraphQL. I guess it was more than uh, three minutes. However, let's go to Product Board's reason. And I would love to present the research we did at Product Board with everything, uh, but I can't because that would be another presentation. So this is going to be more for, uh, you know, like to provide some context for you. So essentially, our old architecture is built around overfetching. That means that we basically get everything we know about the uh, customer, we put it on a client layer, and then we do everything there, like some transformation, etc. 
Uh, that's obviously not ideal if the customer data is growing. If you are getting, uh, let's say, if you have 40 megabytes of the data, you need to download the data, which kind of it's not ideal, obviously. Uh, and the whole system is also uh, written uh, on top of uh, the first flux iteration from Facebook, which is already pretty old. So we have custom solution on top of it. And uh, that means that there's some maintenance cost. Uh, the DX might be suffering in some cases. And we really like, wanted to figure out what we can do with that. You know, uh, We obviously in already like did a lot of small fixes. It looked uh, something like that uh, on the slide. Uh, but uh, then we realized, OK, so we need to keep this like front-end centricity, let's say, because Having everything on a front-end layer is great. You can iterate very, very easily, but we somehow need to figure it out how to make it also effective, but with this, let's say, enablement uh, on a front-end layer. And we kind of answered that with GraphQL. Uh, we were also quite, quite not sure how microservices fits into all, all of it. You know, like, do we going to have some API gateway, how it's going to work? Do we going to have the same format for APIs? We are not sure. If you are interested more in this, uh, there's great talk. By, uh, by Lukash, uh, actually coming from the same tribe uh, from Product Board as, as me, from Platform Tribe, where he actually discussed this very thing with his uh, presentation, loading 40 megabytes of JSON on initial load. And he went into pretty deep dive into the ar architecture I was kind of describing on the fly. So in case you are interested, this is the presentation for you. And now let's go to federated GraphQL. So who knows federation, federated GraphQL? Who knows the concept? That's actually great. Not, not that many of you, which is great because you might learn something, and that's wonderful. This is probably the simplest, uh, let's say, diagram of architecture I can think of if I'm talking about GraphQL, like pure GraphQL. You have some client, you have some database, uh, some, some monolithic, let's say, backend. Um, probably the backend is using, let's say, something like Apollo server in Node. The client might be using some client library for GraphQL, something like Apollo client. I'm not sure. And those both, uh, let's say, components are pretty happy. They are talking to each other and everyone is like, yay, developing in, like with Monolith. Uh, it's awesome. It's like very empowering. However, this is not really like product board's case. You know, we have blooming uh, microservices architecture. There are services being created. Uh, we have chosen Kotlin for that. So we have though this, you know, monolith. However, there are microservices around it. And uh, we were thinking, okay, so what are we gonna do? Like, are we gonna create like monolithic uh, uh, GraphQL layer as a proxy or what are we gonna do? And that's exactly when federated GraphQL comes to play. Uh, so this is much more closer to our architecture. You know, uh, as you can see, there are some services, like some service and another service. Both those services are written in GraphQL, but there's also another service, in this case GraphQL uh, gateway, which is um, providing, uh, and essentially that's the layer client is um, you know, like interacting with. So in this example, like to kind of, um, you know, explain it a bit, a bit more, uh, client knows what's the capability of the whole system by talking to GraphQL gateway. So from the client's perspective, there's just the GraphQL gateway. That's the server, you know, client is using. However, the capability of the GraphQL server, the, um, the schema, the definition of that one graph is then defined in some service, some part of it is defined in some service, and some other part is uh, defined in another service. And uh, like those definitions put together, basically when you compose it together, you get that one, one schema client is then using. Uh, so in this case, each service is kind of responsible for, this, for their set of data. Uh, each service can, um, you know, like, um, develop on its own, there might be different release cycles, etc. However, client is using one API. It, it, it's basically the same, it's abstracted away from it. So let's imagine you have some logic in Monolith, but you are rewriting that to Kotlin. You can expose it from the monolithic server, and then client can immediately use it, and once there's right time, you can start migrating that to Kotlin, and if you don't break the uh, interface, Client doesn't know. They basically don't care because it's abstracted away from it. And speaking about Apollo Federation, 
Uh, I'm speaking about this Apollo Federation, which is open source specification created by Apollo company. Uh, the Apollo company uh, has uh, its own product uh, attached to it. Uh, they are basically providing, uh, you know, um, product, uh, commercial product. Um, I'm going to be talking about it uh, quite later. And what it does in a sense, it's introducing some fancy stuff on top of um, spec valid GraphQL server. Uh, and that basically creates uh, the whole system with GraphQL Gateway. With this, GraphQL Gateway can understand how to do query planning. It's also interesting to say that this approach is used by companies like Netflix, Walmart, Adobe. So there are quite big names in a game, and they are providing feedback to Apollo team. And like with their feedback, there are new iterations of Federation, which is currently in version 2. Speaking about query planning, this is uh, what you get. Uh, as you can see on the, on the slide uh, in the code, you're basically asking for a bunch of stuff, right? It, it, it's not really like important, but you are asking for a bunch of stuff. Um, because how it works, you know, because of those extra directives and stuff I described on the previous slide, GraphQL Gateway can really understand what you are asking for, and GraphQL Gateway has also knowledge um, you know, like who can provide which data and how it works together. So the GraphQL Gateway can do informed decision if it needs to be loaded uh, sequentially or you can load it in parallel. Then it puts everything together and sends it back to the client. And that's basically, in essence, how it works. A client is uh, sending requests, queries uh, to GraphQL Gateway, and GraphQL Gateway can understand it and, you know, collect all the, you know, all the data from the uh, from this very specific part of the distributed architecture and sends it back to the client. So, if you are wondering uh, what's our implementation, you know, so you can, for example, uh, do your research on based on it. Uh, on the front end uh, layer, we did analysis and POCs for exactly three solutions: Apollo client, Oracle client, and Relay. Uh, However, again, like I'm not gonna be really like diving into details of each of solution, but at the end we picked Relay. Uh, we picked Relay mostly uh, due to constraints, forcing you to design your code in a way it scales, and it has also opinionated uh, system around pagination, which is something we really like wanted because you know having opinionated system and constraints, implicit constraints, is always better if you want to scale across the whole company. Uh, this is more for another presentation, but we can discuss it later. Like there are like things with relay, for example, the learning curve is uh, much higher than the other solution, but you are getting some benefits on top of it uh, regarding the scal uh, scalability of the solution and how. Uh, basically, uh, once you once you get it, how easy it is for a company to 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 you know like run it. One small fact: uh, Relay is also made by Facebook now Meta. Uh, so we were kind of thinking, hey, uh, since we are using React, uh, it might be kind of nice idea to use Relay as well because Relay has first-class citizen support uh, for suspense, for example. So we expect that as React is evolving, Relay is going to be evolving next to it. Backend was a bit more straightforward, I would say. Since our strategy uh, is to build new microservices in Kotlin, uh, and by using Spring Boot, we decided to pick Netflix DGS, and we were super lucky because they just released that uh, back in, I think, Q3 of 21. So we took that framework. Uh, and regarding our monolithic server written in Ruby on uh, Rails, we picked uh, GraphQL Ruby, which is pretty decent, like gem, really like good dependence, a dependency battle tested by a lot of companies, ex exactly like uh, GitHub, Shopify, or Kickstarter. So uh, we were quite sure that we can't really like miss the target if you use this one. Um, on top of it, we kind of make mandatory that every microservice willing to or like wanting to join the GraphQL Federation or expose some API for a client for our front-end application needs to follow Federation spec. That's the Federation I was talking about earlier. And also 
global ID spec and pagination spec. Again, I'm not going to be diving into those, but the important thing, uh, you know, like for you, is that those specifications are implied on you by Relay itself. So, like, since we have chosen Relay on a you know front end, we kind of need to follow also with the backend implementation. Um, and the federation itself. Uh, I was already kind of describing that there is some commercial product attached to Apollo Federation, and that's exactly Apollo Studio, which is their managed federation, which they can manage for you as a, as a service. And since we were optimizing for a fastest impact possible, uh, we actually chosen this one. Like it, it had quite reasonable price. I would really recommend to go with Managed Federation if you are trying that because you know you can get the result very easily and then you can evolve it, you can kind of evaluate it, you can see how it works for you. Uh, because it's not just about what it, what it means like federation, right? Uh, with the studio you get like more things, you get change logs, you get notifications to Slack channel when someone push some update into the, into the schema, you have Explorer, there's some discoverability documentation, etc. And also, kind of important fact, uh, Apollo Studio includes this schema registry, which is, which is essentially a way how microservices, we call them subgraph in the federated graphical architecture, can notify GraphQL Gateway that they can resolve something, that they are in charge of some particle like domain. Uh, and it's kind of like registry uh, for the gateway. And th what the gateway does is they, the gateway basically takes um, the capabilities from the schema and based on it, it composes it into one API for a client. So you might be thinking, so what's going to happen like, if, microserv if my microservice is going to like, push some update, which is going to like, shoot everything down? And that's exactly the schema like, um, you know, checking. You just need to ensure that everything what's being pushed to production or to your environment needs to be compatible with the rest of the ecosystem. And that's exactly what we got basically out of the box by implementing Federation, GraphQL Federation with Apollo. So we can really like ensure that no one is removing some field which is still being used in production. We have also the granularity to know which version of our application is calling this field, which query is that, you know, like since you can name the query. So that's, that's really like essential for this whole evolution. And speaking about the observability, um, as you probably understand from the very simplistic um, uh, diagram of architecture, GraphQL Gateway is essentially single point of failure. So what we really like spent uh, our time on is to do something with the observability. Like here's, uh, here's a slide from our data doc. Uh, it's obviously connected to on calls, etc. Because if gateway is down, then you know there's no fun. Uh, so speaking about the data doc, there's also like screen from APM, basically where you can get all the traces. Uh, so how it essentially works is that client asks for data for basically all the data they want, and the gateway can then decide like uh, which service can then call, uh, and you get it in those traces. So it might be an interesting tool for you to kind of understand what's the performance of that particular query. You can, for example, because you can see very in a very detail, it's very granular. For example, what you can see is that there's some microservice speaking to Postgre, and instead of creating one query, the microservice can generate like 10 of them. And if you are interested in this like optimization, you can wait for a next presentation by uh, Michal, because like, he's going to cover it uh, with uh, his presentation about uh, data loaders. This is uh, the last slide from this observability uh, part of the presentation, uh, where you can see um, this is exactly Apollo Studio. And this is some example of some CI CD check uh, which failed uh, because someone was trying to mess with something what's being used uh, or what was used uh, on production back then. So it failed, it provided some information which version is using that, etc. So, yes. And now we are. Um, you know, getting to the finals. Um, here's the part uh, I would love to hear before I started to work on this half a year ago. It's like morphing, you know, phase. Uh, how to roll it out? Like, how to roll it out GraphQL? You know, I heard a couple of stories. I would love to use, use GraphQL in my company. I'm not sure where to start, especially if, it, if, it, if it's not, uh, you know, like Greenfield, right? You need to somehow figure it out, how it all fits together, etc. So this, this part is going to be about this. 
And we are also getting to the beginning of the presentation because the ring is our internal, let's say, brand for our GraphQL implementation. And I think it was quite a nice decision because if you are referring GraphQL in your company like GraphQL, it, it's, it, it, it's a little bit ambiguous, you know, like you have newcomers coming to the company, like what does it mean GraphQL? You know, like this, it's, it's, it's kind of specification, not pretty long one. It's not super opinionated regarding best practices, not even about like Camel's case, Pascal case, etc. So uh, there are like few missing gaps. So the ring is for us, product borders, basically the implementation. The ring is Apollo Federation, the ring is uh, uh, like other sp uh, specifications like pay, uh, pagination spec or a global ID spec. It's basically relay on the front end and the whole ecosystem, how it works. And you might be asking where the heck this reference or Lord of the Rings is coming from. And I prepared this slide for you because this is actually a meme I created in our like Slack, like meme, meme Slack channel. And yep, uh, that's, that's me kind of picking this ring, you know, like this data fetching. Because we were discussing data fetching internally for some time. You know, like we obviously understood that, hey, we are overfetching quite a lot. It's not performant anymore. We need to do something about it. We can either like, you know, you know we, we need to rethink that. And I, I was, you know, like, part of the, those discussions and I decided, okay, so I'm going to do it. You know, I'm not sure what I'm going to do it, but I'm, I'm going to do it. And as in the books and movies, I wouldn't be success, uh, successful if I wouldn't have my, you know, fellowship team around me. So uh, kudos those two, uh, those, uh, to those guys. Unfortunately, they are, they are not here today, but yeah, you can find their uh, Twitter handles, uh, like Huvik, Luka, Chechan, and Balvais. Uh, it's essential to assemble a team around you. And with that, what we actually did is that we reiterated on a problem and then we uh, pitched a solution proposal. So if you are in the same situation like I was half a year ago, you need to really like identify individual stakeholders with the context and pitch them this idea. And um, you know, back then I have chosen our uh, staff engineering group here at Product Board and then a couple of like higher ranked managers to uh, run through them this idea. I also created a bunch of uh, diagrams and high level architectures and Honestly, like I reworked these documents multiple, uh, this document multiple times before I succeeded. Uh, the take, you know, like key takeaway here is probably to like be patient. You know, if you are about to introduce GraphQL into your stack to your company, and if the company is fairly big, and we were quite big uh, back, back then, like I would say, like 400 people, like something around 100 people in engineering. Uh, you need to be patient because there's like some risk uh, included in that solution. You really like need to answer all of those corner, corner cases, etc. So like the, take, the key takeaway here is like just be patient. This is uh, super like COVID related uh, because we started this in COVID era, and I re I, I immediately realized that we just need to be super you know, diligent about over-communication. There's basically no such a thing as over-communication in a hybrid uh, system or in remote, in entire remote running of company, which was the case for a COVID. So we immediately started the Notion uh, page, which is called Knowledge Base. Now it serves as an entry point to our um, GraphQL The Ring ecosystem, where you can see, you know, like how to start with GraphQL, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, back then, it also serves us our team, uh, as a team page. There's like team section over there with all those design docs and basically everything. So we were writing down every decision. We wrote down every shortcut we took so we can discuss it later, so we can really, uh, you know, like make sure that everything is covered and someone else can start uh, where we ended. And uh, speaking about the end of the POC phase, or let's say how to wrap the initial research, because obviously we got some time to work on this idea. It was Q4 of 21. And after that, uh, right before Christmas, I recorded this uh, uh, you know, video known as a keynote for the ring. And I think that was also a pretty good uh, decision because I used this video multiple times uh, because I went through all the proposed changes through the all implications it has on our stack. And I really like explain every you know, part of um, uh, the proposed architecture. And then 
I used this a couple of times uh, when someone was asking me for some question, etc. So I just shared the part of the video. We are using Revolt here at Product Board, which is a great platform for sharing videos, but you might have Loom, etc. It's kind of important to be able to uh, point them to a specific minute of the video so they can, uh, they can uh, you know, understand it. What's also important to mention here, I would say, is that we picked Relay, as I said already, and it comes with, you know, kind of paradigm change, you know, you develop the application quite differently. For sure, there's, uh, there are some changes on the backend as well, but I would say specifically on the front end layer with Relay, you just need to really like rethink the approach, how you are designing the application. Relay is really forcing you to think about data, uh, you know, being collocated to the part of the application where you are displaying the data. So you really just need to rewire the brain. So part of our communication was also about uh, create demo implementations so we can share it with the others. And since we have quite rich tech, right, there's uh, Ruby on Rails, there's Kotlin, uh, there is uh, React on the front end layer. We really like need to uh, do those implementations in all of those languages and parts of the code base so everyone can follow that. And last but not least, you need to make it fun. And not just for you, the one you know, developing that or running that dream about GraphQL in your company, but uh, also for the end users of that framework, let's say, of the technology. In our case, and that's something we are super passionate about at Product Board, especially in platform engineering, we develop toolings for uh, or tools and frameworks for uh, our product teams to be uh, to be used and uh, we have dx uh, and usability and accessibility very high in our um, principal list here in uh, platform engineering so we really tried to make it fun for users we just wanted to make it so nice that you just migrate to graphql that you try to use it with your new feature. We just really like need to create the onboarding in a way it's enjoyable, it's well documented, the, the experience just needs to be there. And I would say this uh, might be also quite critical part. Uh, and I think we nailed that because we were able to onboard quite a lot of people at the same time uh, and it, it really worked for us. Of course, uh, if you want to make it even more fun, just create stickers for your project. Just create stickers for that uh, in the same way like we did at Product Board. Uh, no, for real. Uh, spinning such a huge uh, um, and long running initiative takes quarters. So you are looking for influencers. You are looking for people who know GraphQL, people who are a fan of new approaches, for, for people really like uh, trying to step up their game. Those are people you need to approach. Those are people you need to sell the idea to. And stickers might help because people love stickers. So uh, that might be kind of uh, a nice idea for you that uh, stickers uh, might be good, uh, let's say, medium for uh, the success of your idea and project in your company. So in numbers, we started in Q4 uh, 21, as I said, and the first product use cases came early uh, this year. Uh, we have now eight subgraphs connected to our GraphQL gateway in production. Uh, that's something around like 33 queries, uh, 38 mutations, and something around 150 types. I think it might be more. There might be even like some new subgraph uh, today. Uh, not sure. And uh, in a peak, we are getting something around like 500 requests per minute, which is obviously just a sign that we are starting. It's, it's not the number we want to be. Uh, it's also important to mention that, uh, that Product Board is a B2B company. But yeah, it's nice to see that you know, it's, it's, it's growing over time. You have the monitoring, so you can see it's growing. The use cases are growing as well. So uh, to recap this presentation, uh, I hope that in case you didn't know Federated Graph, uh, GraphQL, the federation specification, now you know. And uh, you, you know that it enables uh, client-centric thinking backed by clear ownership and different release cycles per microservice. So in case you are having distributed uh, architecture in your company, this might be actually a good fit for you if you are considering GraphQL. Uh, if you are running something big in your company, it might not be GraphQL, it might be something else, you know. Uh, it's kind of easier to run big things through the company if you name it. So I wouldn't really underestimate it, branding of the thing you are doing, because I think it really made the difference for us. And always, um, big changes requires patience, so you just need to be patient. There are going to be folks you know, telling you, eh, it might not work, 
yeah, you just need to prove them otherwise. So yeah, uh, that's it for today. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, now it's time for questions. And I'm going to share this deck later on my Twitter. So there are a bunch of references so you can go through it in case you are interested in it. And yeah, like I can definitely recommend the production ready GraphQL a book. Uh, that's uh, that's really essential. I'm recommending this book. Uh, basically, <laughs> semi it's like semi mandatory here uh, at Product Board if you are uh, working with GraphQL because it's like really like bunch of uh, full of uh, interesting information and it's part of uh, our best practices here at Product Board. So yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot. Okay, so now let's go to the questions. Uh, what's our time? Are we okay with the time? So yeah, let's, let's do it. So Ivan, how do you authorize requests with nested fields, which might have resolvers in different subgraphs? <laughs> That's a wonderful question. I'm not gonna answer it right now because this is uh, like not the case we are having. However, uh, we currently are exploring possibilities for that. Currently, it works that the subgraph is uh, required to, uh, you know, like do the verification. Everything right now is under API Gateway, so you can't really like access it without uh, not being, uh, you know, um, locked in to Product Board. Uh, we are also quite sensitive about, um, you know, federating fields. It's, it's something you need to really like think about. Obviously, there are discussions, domain-driven design, different owners. So in case you are federating something, it's like important to have especially like uh, discussions like that or ask questions uh, like that to, to really like figure it out before you run into the problem in production, right? But great question. If you are here in Prague, uh, in Prague office right now, Ivan, let's, let's discuss it uh, in after party. I'd love to know your ideas as well. Tom, how long did it take from the start uh, of the research until the first graph uh, query used in production? Yeah, like basically quarter and half. Uh, what I did, uh, and that's, I, I haven't mentioned that, but uh, basically my strategy regarding GraphQL rollout at Product Board was that I really forced myself to join the teams uh, to really like help them to develop their first uh, functionality. So we, you know, like it was beneficial for both for them, for me as well, because I really like wanted to see how they are interacting with the things I built. I wanted to, I wanted to have, I wanted to have that first, uh, you know, like first hand experience. So yeah, it was quarter and something. And the functionality obviously was super small, but yeah, it counts, right? It brings uh, customer value. Thanks. Ivan, how many teams are extending the subgraph in your case? Did you have conflicts in subgraphs and how did you solve them? Yeah, that's a wonderful question because not really. Uh, we, we are not having uh, you know, conflicts yet. Uh, we are thinking about to run a GraphQL guild uh, and like have, let's say, a forum where you can discuss uh, problems. In our current architecture, it works in a way if you push the change first, right, you are kind of setting the setting the scene for the others. So uh, I expect this might be a case uh, for us in the future. And hopefully uh, we will uh, set also like a process how to resolve such a, such a problems. But yeah, it's something we are not uh, really uh, running into. Um, speaking about teams, I think it might be, uh, it might be four different teams now. Which is, uh, you know, there is still time to, or space to grow. Uh, we are at the beginning, so I would say the graph is now diverging rather than converging. Uh, we are in this blooming phase, which is fine. Yeah, uh, how do you measure and compare the performance using GraphQL compared to other solutions? Yeah, like uh, performance. Uh, you mean in a way um, like how long the network requests uh, request take or something like that? Uh, I'm not sure, but if it's if it's about like a network request uh, compared to other solutions, it's also about uh, you know like we really like haven't we wasn't really kind of optimizing for. Obviously, if I would be optimizing for fast requests, maybe I would be calling multiple endpoints and then doing something with that on a front-end layer. But we wanted to kind of prevent that and create, a, um, create um, the experience a little bit differently. So uh, I'm not really sure if it's like about server, uh, server implementation. 
But yeah, uh, we are not really actively somehow measuring uh, the performance of the endpoint, although we are having all the data, we are thinking uh, maybe we should set some fitness functions here. Uh, so for example, every call needs to resolve uh, within some you know, budget. Uh, but yeah, we have data dog, we have everything there. So it's possible to debug what's going on. Um, but our strategy current is to build and observe and uh, optimize uh, later. <laughs> what software did you use to build these slides? Uh, it's called Dexet. It's pretty good software. Thanks. Uh, how do you handle the subgraphs for different environments which might not have all services required for resolvers? Um, for different environments. Uh, Handle some. I'm not, uh, honestly, I'm not sure. Uh, probably I don't really follow the question, uh, and like the question is gone. So yeah, yeah is there? Uh, yeah, like if you are uh, Ivan, if you are here, let's discuss this later. I would love to understand it more. But that might be actually something what we what we do. But yeah. So any other, any other question? That's all, right? So. So thanks a lot again, and let's hang out after Michal's presentation. Thanks.